We bout to party. Unrestricted. Got the house now. We gon' turn it up. Up, bring the house down. Got that big space pump and make them bounce now. Flossing like they bossing and the freaks are coming out now. AEW Unrestricted. Aubrey Edwards, Will Washington, welcome to the official podcast of All Elite Wrestling. We've got new episodes every Thursday, and you are here, you are listening to an exclusive interview with awesome AEW people. This is a really fun show, and sometimes you get to talk about fun backstage stuff. And before we recorded this intro, I was like, hey, Will, uh, what are we going to talk about? Um, But there was actually a funny story that happened on the day of Shelton Benjamin's debut that, uh, Will, you didn't hear about this. No, so, I haven't heard about this at all. That was at the, the Dynamite five-year anniversary. It was a five-year anniversary. Which is funny because that was my segment. And- so like, that's why I'm like really curious how this, <laughs> what happened here. It has nothing to do with this segment. Okay. It's completely after the uh-huh. show. So we do like four Ring of Honor matches before. We do Dynamite. We do Rampage. And then we have another Ring of Honor match after. So it is a very long day. And by the time that... I'm getting on the bus. It is 12.30 at night. And I was in the last match. So I'm one of the last people in the building, right? I'm sitting on the bus. We're, and security's doing the sweep, trying to get everybody that might be hanging out. Like, because this is the last bus. And it's a good 20-minute drive from the venue to the hotel. It's going to be hard for anyone to get an Uber. Like, let's just make sure we get everybody. And we're sitting there. And that bus had been already sitting there for 20 minutes before I showed up. And we're sitting there. We're waiting a good 15 minutes, whatever. And then... Shelton Benjamin stands up and goes, wait, I forgot a shoe, and then runs off the bus. And we're just like, it is your first freaking day. What, what, how, like, what is happening right now? He's like, I'll be right back. He leaves. This dude takes 15 minutes oh, to, no. <laughs> to find, not, not a pair of sneakers, a single sneaker. <laughs> that he had left in the dressing room and he comes back on and we're like welcome to aew bitch like what the <laughs> <laughs> so we did not get back to the hotel until after 1 a.m so what a first day how to make an impression the Sean benjamin way <laughs> ah, i love it though um but of course yeah you know we just talked about the five-year anniversary of aew dynamite five years congratulations aubrey edwards congratulations yeah like honestly i think it's to get to do that show right off the heels of celebrating our brand new TV deal. Uh, it, was, it was just such a great time. And um, and that week in particular was such a cool celebration of all things AEW. And I think this is the perfect show to kind of encapsulate that because our guest today has been a part of so much AEW history and has really been the, the the voice of all of that. And I'm really excited to have him here on this show. Aubrey, who's our guest today? Today's guest is one of the, I was going to say day one peeps, but technically like before day one, I am very happy to have Excalibur back on the podcast. And it's, it's been since early pandemic, I think we had figured out you had been on here. So welcome back, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I like to refer to myself as a day one and a half guy, whereas, you know, the Bucks, Hangman, Kenny, all those guys are day one guys. And I was there at the uh, the ticket on sale thing at the MGM in February. So that's kind of like day one and a half. So we'll count it. We'll count it. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I was there. It's been, been with the company for a long time. It's been really a rewarding last couple of weeks. Uh, you know, just to see where, where things have, have gotten, you know, over, you know, five plus years. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. And thank you guys for having me back. Well, uh, uh, speaking of five plus years, note, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, think, I, I, I think you were exactly actually going to say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think we were on the same page as far as we were going. I like speaking of five plus years, dynamite then you just, just celebrated. Then you just fucking take care of it. Yeah. yeah whatever. <laughs> dynamite just celebrated five years. Uh, and you have, of course been, Really the voice of AEW Dynamite, I think. Yeah. It's only like a handful of shows you haven't been on. I, I, I'm pretty certain it's maybe like five or six, if I'm not mistaken. That sounds about right, yeah. Yeah, and uh, but ultimately, over 250-plus episodes, that's that's a huge accomplishment. Congratulations on that. So I want to talk about your, your favorite stories of being a part of live television, because you and I have had that conversation before about the fact that live TV was something that you kind of got thrown into. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, before before Dynamite began. The only televised live, you know, like cable television or network television, any, any experience I had was the original All In pre-show, and that was uh, on WGN. 
which I, you know, I guess is on most cable networks. I mean, maybe, I don't know, even know if WGN still exists, but... They're News Nation now. Okay. Ooh. Well, so I was on what I guess is now News Nation, but the first experience, the first time I'd had any any sort of inkling of doing anything live was that and i remember in the moment they they cut to me to you know talk about the card coming up on on pay-per-view and i hear this voice just start beginning to speak in my head while i'm speaking i just freeze because i've never experienced this before <laughs> and i kind of freaked out but then i got my bearings and i i kept going and keith mitchell who was the director that day he uh, in in the way in his laconic very steadying manner of speaking he's like hey buddy just know if i'm ever talking while you're talking i ain't talking to you and i was like oh that's actually very helpful and <laughs> from that point out i've somehow just been able to cancel out all the noise cancel out you know for the most part anything that's that's going on in my headset and just really be able to to get my my thoughts across and so that was you know, my first live TV lesson, but I would say it's my most important live TV lesson. Yeah, geez. It's it's one of those things that I don't think people realize how many voices each individual person is listening to while they're doing something else on television. It's very much a uh, rub your stomach, pat yourself on the head type thing where you're just really trying to focus on the job that you're there to do, but also all of this other information is coming in. Do you need to pay attention to it? Because, you know, maybe maybe there is someone who's not Keith Mitchell telling you something that you absolutely do need to know in that given moment. So it's a skill that a lot of people don't have, but from my perspective, it's a skill that you guys have just perfected at this point because I have no idea when you guys miss a beat. Your your whole you and your whole team is freaking incredible. And I'm so happy that like people who are new to wrestling, they're hearing you and you're sort of the the voice of wrestling for them, which is really freaking awesome. Speaking of which, uh, let's talk about your cohorts a little bit because I think the last time we had you on it was early pandemic. And then one of the things that sort of happened during the pandemic was the beautiful relationship that blossoms between you and Taz on Dark, <laughs> which was so absolutely great. What has it been like working with Taz for as many years as you have now? Uh, it's, it's, it's been great. Uh, Taz has become, at least in, in my opinion, a good friend. I don't know if, if you had him on here, what, what he would say, but I don't want to, I don't want to put words <laughs> in his mouth. But, you know, to me, he's somebody that, is a not I mean not only a friend but a mentor as well. I mean, you know, he's been calling wrestling and not not just doing wrestling on TV, but I mean he's also done drive time radio in New York. You know, he's done done all sorts of different media and I mean he's been in and around it for, for more than twenty years and somebody that has a really great brain about all these things. And he's got obviously he's got a lot of opinions and sometimes you get Taz talking and oh, he'll buddy. get on a bit of a <laughs> things will start to snowball but you know at the at the core of but that I digress. Is, but I digress is something that is uh, you know very very beneficial very very informative and so the relationship that that we had that kind of really blossomed on dark i don't think it would have been possible without the time we spent in jacksonville where we would be filming and taz and i would be commentating dark matches until 3 3 30 in the morning and nope. after commentating you know eight hours of wrestling in the cold while just you know drinking nothing but diet cokes and monster energy drinks you get you tend to get a little loopy and <laughs> that that came out and you know fans fans embraced that and so i'm glad i'm glad they did enjoy that and uh you know for me they were some there were some very very cold caffeinated nights but for others uh i've heard from actually quite a few people that they were you know, part of the the things that helped keep them entertained during the pandemic, and you know that that that's actually super meaningful to me. That you know something that I was a part of kept uh, kept people busy, kept people sane, and kept people entertained. Well, also on on the team, and somebody who's had quite kind things to say about you, um, talking about Ian Riccaboni, who of course is voice of Ring of Honor. He's a voice that. We, we try to get as many, as, as often as we can when we're hitting the Northeast areas, but somebody that you've also had a, a great relationship with. Again, like, I don't want to put words in Taz's mouth. I, you know, Taz, or excuse me, Ian, Ian says, you know, that I'm, I'm a good friend. Ian's a true dirtbag, uh, scum of the earth. But, <laughs> <laughs> no, Ian, Ian's somebody that, it, it was all in. That was the first time that I met him and the first time we worked together and, you know, getting put on a live mic on a pay-per-view broadcast with somebody and just 
hoping that you have chemistry is not not an easy thing to do and it doesn't always happen and you know ian and i are both play-by-play guys and it's tough because you you know as a play-by-play guy you always want to take the lead but i think when when he and i work together we we have a good rhythm and you know it's like playing with uh, you know two point guards or two you know, it's not always the point guard that brings the ball up the court. Sometimes it's the the power forward. Sometimes it's, it's whoever. And so, you know, we're able to recognize when, you know, when to lay out, when to pass off to the other guy. And, you know, I, Ian is, I think, a tremendous asset, not only for Ring of Honor, but for AEW. And I, I wish Ian would be around more than, more than just when we're in the Northeast. But I understand that Ian, um, you know, first and foremost is, is a dad. And, the way he likes to be available for his family, you know, kind of doesn't always get along with the AEW broadcast schedule. And I, I totally respect that. And I'm glad that he's, he's in a position where, where he's happy with his, with what he's able to con- contribute to not only AEW, but Ring of Honor as well. And so when we do get to have him, I think it's special. And I, you know, I love, love having him around. He's also just one of those guys that's like a good energy to have around because I don't think I've ever seen him mad or frustrated. I don't know if he has the ability to be mad. If he does, he hides it really, really well. He's got a very good poker face. Ooh, good to know. Good to know. I'm going to, I'm going to now try to like piss him off just to kind of see him break. Oh, oh, he says nasty things about you all the time. I I imagine that to be true. Okay. I got to start slipping him twenties when I'm in the ring. All right. We'll do that. So you'd mentioned like you, you primarily do play by play and your play by play is fantastic. You have an encyclopedic knowledge of just wrestling moves, but then you also have at a moment's notice, you're able to pull in all of these story moments that are happening to kind of keep the audience up to speed. Uh, what does preparation for specifically play by play commentary look like? Well, so play by play is the actual play by play part of it is, is very reactive. And so that's just being in in the moment and kind of calling what you're seeing. And for a very long time, for pro wrestling gorilla, I was play by play and color commentator. So I was I was handling both roles. And I sometimes have to even still, even though I've been doing AEW for five plus years, still have to catch myself and realize that oh no, I have I have Taz there, I have Nigel or somebody else that that's there to explain it as well. And for me though, the actual show prep, the storytelling aspect of it is something where, you know, earlier the day or the, you know, the night before, if I'm on the plane or whatever, I'll sit down and I I write out my notes, but during the show, I don't typically refer to it. It's just more the, the act of writing it out makes it fresh in my mind. It brings, brings it to the forefront and it makes it a lot easier for me to recall. And for me, it's very easy to recall stuff that happened on dynamite because I was there, I was speaking about it, but if I'm watching a collision, and I see something, but you know, maybe I'm not as immersed in it as I would be if I if I was in the arena at the desk on on headset calling it. Sometimes it takes me a second, so that's when it's very helpful for me to actually go in, write out, you know, just kind of my thoughts. And it's actually not even my thoughts; it's it's a recap, kind of of what happened, just to make it fresh in my mind. And and that's that's my the majority of my show prep. Uh, and so you know, kind of bringing it back to talking about the fact that you know you've been calling Dynamite now for five years. You know, what sort of things did you feel like you had to learn in the the live TV aspect of things, things like traffic, things that you maybe didn't have before in your commentary experience? The yeah, I mean, the, the traffic is I and mean, that's kind of the inside baseball term for it. But, uh, you know, that's that's what we call the the countdowns to when, you know, interviews to when, to when we switch off to Renee or you know somebody else backstage that's doing conducting an interview that's when we switch off to a video package that's when we we go to commercial break and that's something that even you know with with AEW I'd called three shows I'd called Double or Nothing Fighter Fest and Fight for the Fallen before the first episode of Dynamite aired and those were essentially pay-per-views and there's not a lot of traffic on pay-per-views and also that was something where where Jim Ross was the guy that was in the lead chair and so he was doing a lot of the play calling and so that was something just by by being near him and watching how or hearing literally how how he would throw to things and like when you know when we get a count in our ear that you know okay renee's standing by she'll be ready in 10 9 8 and how he would be able to wrap up his thoughts from you know from the match at hand or from whatever the business at hand was and then transition in six seconds to to whatever you know is going on backstage that you know is an art and it's a very tough art 
to grasp. And I, I think, you know, even five years in, I, I do an okay job at it. I think there's always room for improvement. And it's something that I strive to improve at every, with every single broadcast. And, you know, it's, it's little intangible things like that, that if I'm good at it, then nobody notices, you know, and that's, that's, that's the toughest thing is, is, you know, going, going unseen or going unheard for something that, that, you know, the, the best thing that people can do is just take it for granted. I literally just learned this term now, five years of live television. It's the first time I've ever heard that specific thing referred to as traffic. I had no idea. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just the, the car coming down the road. You have to, you have to hold out the stop sign and you have to, you have to wave this guy through and then you have to pick up traffic coming back the other way. Damn. See, I, I forget because I did TV news 15 years ago and it's just like a thing that I think when I say it, people know that. And then it's like, my bad. I know the concept, just not the name. So. But <laughs> right. now, now I feel more informed. I got something out of this podcast today. Thank you both. <laughs> well, that's, that's it. That's the that long episode. That's it. Well, actually, uh, this is a good time for a commercial break. So we have much more to talk about here on AEW Unrestricted. Stay tuned. AEW Unrestricted. It's Aubrey and Will with our guest, Excalibur, the voice of of All Elite Wrestling, the voice of AEW Dynamite, the voice of Rampage, uh, the voice of every pay-per-view we've done. I don't think you've missed a pay-per-view. Have you missed a pay-per-view? I've not missed a pay-per-view. <gasps> I didn't think so. So yeah. he's one of four people who have been on every single pay-per-view. And, and like I said, it's it's incredible how much you've gotten to be a part of so many incredible, iconic AEW moments. And that's kind of what I wanted to, to talk to you about here. Because again, we just celebrated five years of Dynamite. We've had an incredible streak of pay-per-views. There have been some awesome moments that have had Excalibur on the call. When you think about some of the greatest debuts in AEW history and the fact that you got to be the soundtrack to that. What are some of those, like, how do you prepare for those types of moments for one? And then the other piece of that is what were some of your favorites? Preparation is very minimal. Uh, oftentimes we, even as broadcasters, don't know when somebody's debuting you know uh we'll see we'll see backstage that there's a room that's uh labeled reserved for special guest and nope, it's my favorite <laughs> that could be a room that's reserved for shad khan or that could be a room that's reserved for mercedes Monet. and you know like with mercedes that was an interesting scenario because the entire event was branded around her so we had a we had a pretty good inkling that she would be there but actually funny enough the, the most recent one was uh, uh, not the most recent, the most recent was Shelton Benjamin, but uh, prior to that was MVP. And we, we didn't know that MVP would be coming out to interrupt Prince Nana. And the first thing that I think Taz and I both were doing simultaneously were radioing back to the truck saying, can we call him MVP? Mm. Right. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes that, that element of surprise that, you know, surprises the fans at home also catches us by surprise. And so I think, you know, in, in those moments, you're getting a very, very genuine reaction out of us. And, you know, that's, that's something that is not always easy to get, you know, there's a lot of things, you know, in, in not even just in professional wrestling, but, you know, in, in, in sports, in entertainment that, that can f have a tendency to feel manufactured. And my, and I think our at the desk, goal is to not you know have things feel canned or manufactured to think to be there and to, to share that excitement with the fans at home and you know share that moment with them and so i think that's a lot of time why us being surprised works so well you know is that we don't we don't know these things are coming and when when, when it does happen we're you know we're, we're caught up in it just like just like the fans at home hopefully are and the fans in the arena as well and we were talking about it just just before we, we hit record, but I, I think still to to this day, the most exciting for me, triple whammy was at All Out when Minoru Suzuki was a surprise, Adam Cole was a surprise, and Brian Danielson were a surprise, and two of those three guys I knew quite well. Ruby Soho was one too that night. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's true. I I did not mean to to discount that. Um, there's just so, so yeah. much going on that night. We forgot about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. It was a huge night for surprises. And I think it was uh, it was almost the case of, well, there can't possibly be more, one more. Can there? <laughs> right. you know, going, so. so, yeah, that was the, I think, the most memorable just, just out of sheer quantity, if nothing else. 
You know, I was telling you before the show how, like, you know, the call I remember the most. And I was in the arena live, so I hadn't even heard the call until I went back and watched it later. But literally, as Brian Danielson has made his AEW debut and uh, the, the fans are, are guessing and everybody's just excited. And as we go off the air and you say, AEW is the home of professional wrestling. And that was just, that felt so good as we faded to black and... That's a call that, to this day, I mean, you know, we hear it in packages, we hear it in the, the, everything. That That is a call that's so synonymous with AEW. And it was it was a spur-of-the-moment thing. You know, it was just something that I, I had not intended on saying that, but it just felt right in the moment because, you know, we had such a great roster at the time, and then to get that, that sh I mean, shot in an arm, shot in the arm even kind of downplays the, the addition of talent that happened all on that one night. And it really... It felt good. It felt like, you know, pro wrestling had come home and the home was AEW. And and that's not to say that it, it hadn't been before, but, you know, having, having, if nothing else, the guy that many, many people looked at as not just the greatest wrestler of his generation, but perhaps one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, you know, come to, to AEW in order to wrestle, in order to be a part of this pro wrestling company, that I think said a lot you know, in, in the actions of Danielson. And then so to, to be able to put words to it was, is very cool. And it was something that I think, you know, I'm glad that, that it resonated with people. And I'm glad that it's still something that's being heard today. So one of the things that is always really exciting is our Forbidden Door pay-per-view, because we always end up seeing new guests come through and we have these new dream matches that no one ever thought was possible that is now just a regular thing for us, which is amazing. And you having also your encyclopedic knowledge of wrestling moves, you also seemingly have an encyclopedic knowledge of just all wrestling. So what is it like being involved in an event like Forbidden Door from your perspective as someone who is a fan of wrestling, but also someone who works in wrestling? And are there any particular moments that really stand out from any of the Forbidden Door shows? Uh, Forbidden Door is a really cool event because prior to AEW, I'd done commentary for New Japan Pro Wrestling a couple times. And so uh, I'd been, you know, a longtime fan of New Japan, of a lot of the wrestlers there. And so to be able to call those shows prior to AEW was, was really cool, really rewarding for me. And, you know, after I joined up with AEW, I thought, okay, well, that, that part of my life, that or the part of my career is over with. And so Forbidden Door gives me an opportunity to, you know, call those wrestlers again. And it's not always easy. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think you don't get the the level of of knowledge of professional wrestling that 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 I or anyone has without without putting in the legwork for it. And so it does it does require a lot of a lot of research, a lot of a lot of hours spent watching. When you know maybe you know when when you're a fan and you're consuming pro wrestling, that's something that you're doing kind of for fun. But when your job is pro wrestling and your job is you know almost a seven day a week job then you know the last thing you might want to do is watch you know some some videos from japan or from any any other pro wrestling you know maybe maybe you just want to watch a little bake-off and you know that's okay but <laughs> then you gotta you gotta make time for um you know you gotta make time for for destruction and kobe as well and so you know it's just it's a balancing act and i think the most memorable moment in forbidden door it was not actually anything to do with you know a match itself it was when the first time that Danielson uh, came out to Final Countdown, mm -hmm. in eight, I think that was at Forbidden Door in Toronto, and he's coming, he's entering, and and he's doing, uh, you know, the entrance. The, the song is playing, and I didn't realize this at the time, but as as it was going on, is I have an internal clock for that song because he used it on the indies for so many years, and I called so many of his matches in PWG where he used that song that when that chorus kicks in, like, I know that that's when the fans are going to shout. And so I'm doing this whole preamble that, you know, talking about Danielson, talking about what this match means, blah, 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 blah. And while I'm doing that, everybody is screaming in my ear, just saying, shut up. You got to wait for the course. You got to wait for the course. And then Tony gets on. He's like, the course, the course, the course. And, and I just somehow was able to ignore, finish my thought. <laughs> I, I finished my thought and then you hear the crowd hit the final countdown and then Tony gets my ear and goes, that was fucking great. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know what's the best part too is I was sitting right next to Tony as that was all happening, and it's like to know it from two sides of it because then I've watched it a million times. I've watched that entrance, and I agree that was such an incredible call. Your timing on it was impeccable. The way that you also threw in the um, uh, the the Pistons references and all of that, like it was all great. Uh, <laughs> Everything worked out perfectly because those that don't know Excalibur is also a big basketball fan. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But um, but the the fact that it was all, it all played out so perfectly and it all laid out perfectly. But also knowing how much that entrance meant to, to Tony and to make mm-hmm. it happen and how excited he was really all day long to make sure that this entrance went off without a hitch, that it was going to be perfect, that it was edited perfectly. Shout out, I think Mikey Ruckus did make the uh, the TV edit of it. And so to make sure that was all perfect and everybody coming together to make that happen. So great. It's yeah, so great. and I, I just, after, you know, after it happened, and I, he's, after he said, oh, that was fucking great. I just keep back to him. I said, thank you for trusting me. That's all That's all I said, mm. you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and no, but I mean, that's, it. I, I legitimately meant that because it's it's a high level of trust to put in in one person, put in me that, you know, I am for better, or for worse, the, the soundtrack of the broadcast. And it could be very, I could have very easily trampled what could have been a huge moment. And, you know, I obviously would have been super disappointed in myself, but I would also let my boss down. And so, you know, for, for him to put me in that chair, to put me in that position, it requires a lot of trust. And I, and that's not something that I take for granted. We avoided another Suzuki gate. So thank you for that. <laughs> What was that? What did the, the internet dub that was the Suzuki incident? Something or other. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, something like that. It was, it was a great time. It was one of my uh, all time favorite uh, memes to come out of AEW. And so, again, uh, you know, talking about some of the, the major calls you've gotten to make and some of the the education you have for talent. Again, you know, it's it's interesting bringing those two things back around because we talked about some of the debuts that have happened in AEW history and some of the people you weren't even aware were coming out. But at the same time, you're almost immediately able to draw from that Excalibur brain and bring us the information that we need, bring fans that information of, uh, you know, you may not have known this person was coming. You get to give the initial shock and then provide the audience with everything you know in that moment about that person. And that, I think, takes a really talented commentator to make happen. Well, it's it's not something that, that was always there. I, I, I mentioned it on a podcast before. I don't know if it was unrestricted or elsewhere. But, you know, it's something that I had to learn the hard way because on was Dynamite 4 or 5 when the, the Butcher and Blade emerged from under the ring. And I was like, oh, my God, it's the Butcher and the Blade. And Jim Ross goes, who are they? And what he meant was, explain who these guys are, explain what they're doing there. But I just kept repeating, it's the butcher and the blade as if he didn't hear me. And it's something that I'm, I'm still embarrassed by, but it's something that I'm glad happened because it taught me a very important lesson that, yeah, I know who the butcher and the blade are. JR didn't know who they were. A lot of people that were watching the television show, that was their first time seeing them. And so if, if I had been better prepared or, you know, had an answer that was ready to go. It's like, oh, these guys are, you know, the most bloodthirsty mercenaries in all pro wrestling. That's something that, you know, when, when these debuts happen, there's the initial shock, but then I have to think about like, okay, how am I going to explain this person? I'm going to go back and watch that now. <laughs> it's freaking great, man. Cause I'm just sitting there like, wait, how, how did we build a hole into the ring? Like there were so many questions I already had in that moment. It was great. <laughs> This fantastic conversation. I'm learning so much. I love hearing just the different perspective for someone who's been around for so long. Uh, We've got a little bit more coming up here on AEW Unrestricted, but first up, quick break. AEW Unrestricted, Aubrey, Will, Excalibur. It's been five years of Dynamite, and we've heard a lot of Excalibur's voice. He is the voice behind Dynamite, the soundtrack of AEW, and I'm so excited that we have him back for a second time on uh, AEW Unrestricted. So one of the things that I always wonder on pay-per-view day is when do you get a break? Because that's oftentimes six hours of wrestling. And like... No one can have a bladder that strong. So what's the secret? Willpower. Uh, uh, no, I, we, don't, we don't typically get breaks. Um, you know, it's just something that you just got to deal with. You got you to gotta persevere. And um, 
you know, it's like being, uh, you know, you know, those, those flights where the, the seats are, are five across. It's like, it's like being in that middle seat for, for six hours and, you know, you just, you just can't get up and you can't use the restroom. So you just gotta, um, you know, you gotta focus. Yeah. It's a lot, a lot of Zen, a lot of clenching. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what the male version of kegels is, but it's not, it's a lot of that. And uh, yeah, I, it's, you know, it's, it's not something that really bugs me until the end of the night when, you know, it's like when you're getting close to the finish line, I think never having run a marathon, I can't, can't attest to this, but if you're, you know, if you're 15 miles into the marathon, you're not really thinking about the finish line. You're just thinking one foot in front of the other. But you know, when you're, you're 22 right. miles of the marathon, you're like, all right, I know I'm getting close. And usually about when, uh, when the main event gets in the ring, I'm like, all right, let's go. But routinely the main event ends up being the longest match of the night. Right. Oh my God. So for you to be calling the matches you are as excellently as you are, knowing that you're in that physical state, I have even more respect well, for you now. Than thank you. Before. You know, and the, the funny thing is people ask me, it's like, well, you just must stop drinking, drinking water or drinking anything at like two in the afternoon. But it's speaking that much, you're, you know, you're, you're expelling so much moisture from your mouth, from your body. And then plus you're sweating, you know, in, in a suit, under a mask, in, in an arena, under the lights. And, you know, you're constantly, you know, your body is, is perspiring. So you're constantly... I think really that's, that's what benefits me. I mean, having never really thought about the physiological aspects is that the amount that I drink during a pay-per-view is actually just keeping myself level. It's not filling, filling everything up too much. At least I hope. I don't know. The, the same amount in is the same yeah, amount exactly. out kind of a thing. We don't disturb the balance. And the other side of that, too, is it has to increase tenfold wearing a mask through it, it all. It does. Yeah. It's, uh, there was only one time that get really, really shaky was, I think it was double or nothing. It was definitely during the, it was in Jacksonville. I think it was in one of the double or nothings where it was so humid and so hot that even though I was sweating, you know, I wasn't, my body wasn't cooling down and it was right as the main event started to get in the ring, I started to get lightheaded. And so I had to go, oh, no. go off, you know, off camera and like pull off my mask and, you know, just take like a, a big deep breath. And then what I ended up doing was just took a bunch of ice cubes and put them in my mask and put my mask back on and jumped in for the main event. And I, I don't know, I can't remember which show it is off the top of my head, but on air, JR turns to me, he's like, you all right, kid. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> and like, we had this like weird. Was that like, all in or all out that year? The one that was like super hot? It might've been. Yeah, yeah. it might've been. And I, it was the first time I had worn that mask. And what I had realized is like, because of all like the sequins and stuff on it, the the heat and the moisture couldn't escape as effectively and so you know there's there's masks that i wear when i know i'll only be calling wrestling for two hours and then there's masks that i wear when i know i'll be calling wrestling for six hours is that something that you specifically like go to your mask maker for like hey i need like a long a long wear mask for this one use these sort of materials like have it be something that i can wear for you know five plus hours no i i, I mean usually my request all the time i mean having having learned from that experience is just it needs to be breathable. It needs, it's, you know, it just needs to be comfortable for five hours. And so that was, uh, that's, that's my, my number one request above all else. And then everything else is kind of dealer's choice. Damn. Oh, didn't even think about that. So I want to talk about Bola in January of 2023, because this is sort of one of the things that makes AEW great is that our people can kind of show up anywhere. And just to kind of set the scene, like, Chris Jericho and the Jericho Appreciation Society. You're talking shown about, up. Sorry, this is my broadcaster mind kicking in. You're talking about Pro Wrestling Guerrillas 2023 Battle of Los Angeles. Correct. Yes. Thank you for saying the full name correctly, <laughs> just so we could make sure that we got the branding right. <laughs> PWG Battle of Los Angeles. No, say the way we should have done that is what's Bola? And then yeah. that's when you. <laughs> right? <laughs> he goes, it's, it's Bola. <laughs> Anyway, to set the scene, uh, Jericho and the Jericho Appreciation Society had shown up the night before as like a huge just surprise for uh, the audience. And then the next night on night two, they had uh, a match. It was a tag match with, you know, uh, Evil Uno, Jonathan Gresham, Kevin Blackwood, Michael Oku. There was someone else in there that I'm forgetting. Um, SB. SB Kento. Yeah. SB Kento. Yeah. Not to correct you, but they had shown up. They'd only shown up on, on night two. There was okay. no no indication on night one that would happen. So basically, Battle of Los Angeles is a two-night, sometimes three, tournament, uh, knockout elimination tournament in Pro Wrestling Guerrilla that um, on the second night, 
before the final round match goes goes into the ring, there is a multi-person match with all the people that were eliminated from the tournament on night one. It's one of the best matches of the entire weekend. I would say it's it's one of the most unique and fun matches. And a lot of surprises. A couple of years ago, or, I mean, this is more than a decade ago, Jushin Thunder Liger was in it. The clips are all over YouTube. If you Just look up Liger, Bola. And, and really quick, just for anybody who's not aware of your direct connection to PWG, and kind of elaborating on that. Um, so I am one of the co-founders of Pro Wrestling Grill. It began in 2003, uh, July of 2003. It was the, you know, basically the biggest independent promotion on, on the West Coast. And it's where a lot of people, you know, like, like the Young Bucks, Scorpio Sky, really kind of rose to, uh, rose to prominence on a national level. And it's also where guys like like Will Ospreay, Zack Sabre Jr. It was really kind of the first time that they they had a chance to break out in the United States. Kenny Omega was our world champion. Brian Danielson was world champion for us. Claudio Castagnoli was world champion for us. So it's, uh, it's uh, there's kind of been a who's who of professional wrestling that has come through pro wrestling guerrilla through the years. And for a long time, it was it was the only alternative, you know, or not the only alternative, but it was it was part of the alternative of professional wrestling. And it was a style of professional wrestling that was not represented on television where now the style that PWG kind of, you know, pioneered or elevated is ubiquitous, you know, in professional wrestling. I mean, we just saw Will Ospreay and Ricochet have essentially what was a PWG match on yep. free TV or, you know, on cable TV. So long story long, the, the big 10 person match at, at battle of Los Angeles night two in 2023 all the the guys that were eliminated on the first night they come out and everybody's waiting 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 to see who comes out first and i think it was first judas starts playing mm. and then daddy magic and cool hand come out then jake hager comes out then sammy ty and anna j come out and everybody's like i'm I, in my position is I'm, I'm right by the curtain but i can see the fans that are, are sitting there at ringside and people are just slowly losing their mind as they're, as they're realizing what's about to happen. And then finally, everybody's looking at the curtain and as the true showman that he is, he takes a beat, takes an extra beat, takes a third beat. And then finally Jericho comes through the curtain and the place erupts. And it was a thing that, you know, no, no one had expected to happen, but because of PWG or because of AEW and its roots in you know, not only places like Ring of Honor, but places like Pro Wrestling Gorilla is the thing that, that was still allowed to happen. And the genesis of it, which I don't know if you guys can see this, but Chris Jericho. This, this text oh, was at 2.27 <laughs> in the morning. Chris Jericho just said, I want to work PWG. <laughs> and I like I, that you I, took a screenshot of it. I, well, because it was so ridiculous. And I just Who said, thought? I mean, I, I was looking not just at the, the timestamp of that, but the date that was months in advance. Mm -hmm. That yeah. was, uh, that was <sighs> quite some time prior. Yeah. Uh, it was actually eight, eight, nine months in advance. And so it was, you know, he, he kept on talking about it and I was like, Oh, come on, Chris, you're full of shit. You know, that, that's never going to happen. Never going to happen. <laughs> and then as it got closer or, you know, as, as, Time went on, Chris was like, no, I'm, I'm serious. I really want to do this. And I said, well, okay, I mean, here's this thing that we do on this tournament. And he's like, that's perfect. We're going to do it. And so the, the backstage at the, the Globe Theater in LA is not very large. And mm -mm. so what Chris did is he actually rented a party bus that went in the alley behind the Globe. And he used that as their locker room. And so those guys uh, were all changing in there. And then I remember I saw Michael Oku in the afternoon and I said, are you ready for tonight? And he's like, yeah, I'm not even sure what I'm doing. I'm like, oh, you're wrestling Chris Jericho. He's like, yeah, <laughs> whatever. And I'm like, oh, no, no, you're wrestling Chris Jericho. And like his, his face just dropped. And then, um, you know, he, at, at the end of the night, I was like, hey, how was it? You wrestled Chris Jericho. And, he, and all he could do is just, man, I wrestled Chris Jericho. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Such a good kid. Yeah. And so it was, it was a really cool moment, but it, it wouldn't be possible without AEW. I mean, without, without Tony a being so cool at things like this, but also too, Chris Jericho being so cool about things like this, because he had said that, you know, it had been 25 years since he had wrestled in front of a crowd that size. 
And the thing was that on, on that night and, you know, I mean, as is, is commonplace with PWG, the size of the crowd uh, belies, or I guess the noise of the crowd belies the size of the crowd because they're, they're routinely so enthusiastic and so loud that you would think there's twice as many people in the building. And, and Chris, you know, Chris had said as much. He was like, he's like, I, I couldn't believe it when he walked through the curtain. Or he said that he couldn't believe it when he walked through the curtain, how loud and how, how intense that was. Well, and it's like, because there's the Globe Theater is such a beautiful building and because there's multiple stories. So you have all of this noise just kind of funneling down towards the ring. It's an absolutely incredible spot. And like, it's a concert venue, you know, and it's, right. it's not it's not a typical wrestling venue. Yeah. So it's all all the energy is coming toward the stage and the stage happens to be where the ring is set up. It's such it's so cool. And like seeing stuff like that just makes me so happy to like work at a place like AEW where these ridiculous things that you never would have imagined could happen. And then now in 2024, we're just like, oh, yeah, no, that makes sense. That's totally something that would happen. But 10 years ago, like who would have thought you would see Chris Jericho at one of the premier independent organizations in wrestling? And he continues to do it time after time. He popped up in, right? in RevPro in the UK. He's going down to CMLL. I mean, he's, you know, I mean, he's somebody that that eats, lives, sleeps, and breathes professional wrestling. And, you know, he's somebody that, that wants to leave the business better than, than, when, than when he found it, you know. And I think he's doing that. And I, and I think also that's, that really speaks to a large part of the philosophy of AEW. And, you know, uh, a lot of the, the veterans that we have here are, are here, you know, it's, there, there's the, the, the MLS, the Major League Soccer, often gets gets knocked as the the retirement league for for European players. And um, you know, if if you were crass, you could you could say that about AEW. But that you know, being there day in and day out, that's definitely not the case. It's a place where these people are coming to AEW because they feel like they have more to give to professional wrestling. They have more to give to the next generation of professional wrestling. And just like the MLS has, has grown up and is no longer really a retirement league, AEW, I mean, not to say that it ever was, but it was really just showing it time and time again. When we add these people to our roster, it's not, you know, they're, they're not just there to collect a paycheck. They're there to, to play a meaningful role. They're there to impart knowledge on the next generation of pro wrestling. And that's, that's something that's really cool to see on a, on a firsthand basis, not only backstage, but on screen as well. So before we go, I have one more question. And we did just celebrate the five-year anniversary of uh, Dynamite. So congrats to you both. Uh, we did just lock in a new TV deal. Congrats to you both. Congrats to us all. Congrats to us all. That was one of the best things about that day is everybody's walking around saying, congratulations, happy birthday. Like <laughs> It was such a fun day. It filled with so much stuff. But that being said, it's been five years. We've all grown and changed quite a bit and become completely different people, regardless of how long you've been in wrestling prior to AEW starting. So what would you say is the biggest difference with Excalibur at the five-year mark now compared to when you first started? And what do you want to see for Excalibur in the next five years? Um, I think five years ago, I was just kind of reacting. You know, I was I just kind of being like, like, oh, shit. I'm, you know, like I, I'm, I'm between Jim Ross and Tony Schiavone. I hope I don't screw up. I hope I don't, you know, I hope I don't make myself look bad. I hope I don't make the company look bad. And you know, because it was the early days of AEW and people were still, I mean, every time somebody tunes in, it's, it's a judgment that, th that they're making on whether I want to continue to watch this, whether it's a TV show or, or you know, a, a scripted television show, whether it's pro wrestling, no, no matter what it is. And so, you know, that part of me that was very nervous is now replaced by more intentionality where... I go in there saying like, okay, I want to do, th these are my goals uh, during this broadcast. I want to, you know, I want to sell this pay-per-view. I want to get people to tune in next week, but I also want to enhance these, these stories that are, that are playing out on our program. I want to, I want to give people a chance to get to know these athletes and what, who they are and what motivates them and things like that. And that, that was something that maybe I was doing at the time, but it wasn't necessarily conscious. You know, whereas today it's it's more conscious, and I think if I'm lucky enough to be in in this you know position five years from now, I think where I would like to be in ten years of AEW is is developing helping develop the next generation of voices of of AEW and whoever could uh, you know 
or taking the knowledge that I've gained from JR, from Taz, Shivani, you know, from Nigel, from Ian, uh, from Caprice, from everybody that I, that I get a chance to work with on air, taking all that knowledge, distilling it down and passing those lessons along to, to whoever the next generation is. I think that is something that uh, would be super rewarding and something that I hope I get the chance to do. I hope it's something you get the chance to do as well, especially considering since the last time you were here on this show, and it is an important point to note, you're a three-time, three-time, three-time announcer of the year winner. And that, I think, is a strong testament to what you have brought to commentary on all scales of professional wrestling and uh, particularly on AEW TV. And we thank you for doing that for these last five years. And thank you for being a part of the show today. No, thank you, guys. And, uh, Will, I'm glad... You know, Justin Roberts couldn't be here today, but he he perpetually reminds me about that and much to my chagrin. So I'm glad you were able to do it as well. <laughs> oh, Absolutely. Wonderful. There was no way I was going to let that get by here. Folks, keep checking out new episodes of AEW Unrestricted. It's available on all of your favorite podcast platforms. You can get it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And you can check out video episodes of this show every uh, Monday available on our YouTube channel, AEW Unrestricted. Just do a search for that and hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And catch up on all the latest AEW shows on the go when you download the TNT and TBS apps from the App Store and Google Play. Then sign up for our weekly newsletter at tntdrama.com slash Elite Fleet to get updates on upcoming shows, live events, sweepstakes, merchandise, and more. AEW Dynamite on TBS Wednesdays at 8 p.m., AEW Rampage on Friday, TNT, 10 p.m. AEW Collision live every Saturday on TNT. Uh, and of course, watch ROH.com for the latest ROH shows every Thursday on Honor Club. I'm Will Washington. That's Aubrey Edwards for our guest, Excalibur. We'll see you next time. Have a great day. Come on, throw your hands up. Let me see you. Unrestricted. Got the house now. We gonna turn it.